not very long at all. Uh, we've been dealing with how to study the Bible. And we've talked about the difference in reading the Bible, uh, memorizing the Bible, and studying the Bible. Uh, I, I gave you the tools you would need to study the Bible. It's pretty basic. Uh, you can get a good Bible dictionary, uh, get a good concordance. I would personally recommend two other books, uh, Wilmington's Guide to the Bible. I, I think one of the greatest books ever been written. The neat thing about it is in 1978, I moved from Jacksonville to live with my Uncle Jack, and I went to Baptist University of America. Well, during that semester, Harold Wilmington, who was Jerry Falwell's, he, he was Jerry Falwell's head of his Bible in Lynchburg, Virginia. That's where he was at. He had not wrote, he had not published the book yet, but he had the manuscript. So he came to BUA, and he taught in 25 hours, completely through the book. And he gave us a manuscript. Of course, I had no idea what a manuscript is, so I had to buy the book 20 years later. But I recommend Wilmington's Guide to the Bible. It's a big book, a little expensive book. You'll pay probably on your book clubs, your used books, you'll pay 25, 30 bucks for it. And then I recommend, of all books outside the Bible, the Matthew Henry Commentary. And you can do it two ways. You can buy the little, it's not that expensive. You can buy the six volume set for like $39. And better than that, what I do when I study, like I was at Eddie's store the other day, and you can go online on my phone and you look up Matthew Henry Online Commentary. And you can look up any chapter, any verse you want to. You can just put in there, 1 Samuel 6, it'll pop up for you, and you have got to have the book. Now, you, know, you don't print it out for you or nothing, but you can look at it. So that's the things that, that's the basic things that I would, you know, tell you to get to help study the Bible. Uh, you don't need more than that. You can add more than that if you want to. Some people do. Uh, I will study it. As a matter of fact, last night at the house, and I had my woman as guide to the Bible, uh, and I had my Matthew Henry commentary and my King James Bible and my notepad and pen. And that's all I had, you know. So anyway, we've been through that already. And we said you've got to come up with a time. Uh, it, it's got to be something the Bible says study to show thyself approved. So you really got to come up with, I believe, a time because Bible study is work. Bible reading is not work, okay? Now, so we did all that on Bible study, and today I want to give you some things that I think are pretty neat, okay? I want to ask you a question. If somebody said to you, how does God reveal himself to man? How does God reveal himself to man? There, I've got three ways in here. If you think about it, if you just really think about it, you probably, I believe you'll get two of them, maybe three, but let's see. How, if somebody said to you, and you're talking to an unsaved or an unchurched man, he says, you know, he says, well, well how does, because you, you, sometimes we say, oh, the Lord blessed me here, the Lord blessed me there, and Lord told me to do this, and Lord told me to do that. Of course, you know and I know the Lord gets blamed for a lot of things he has nothing to do with. Can somebody say amen? Okay? And I've been guilty of it myself. But if somebody said to you, how does God reveal himself to man? What would be your answer? Give me one at a time. There's three of them. Holy Spirit. It's really the main three ways. Holy Spirit. Mm, yeah, that, that's an answer. That's not a wrong answer, but that's not the three ways. Uh, I'll explain in a minute that you're partially right, so you won't get an eh, you know, you'll get a, you'll get a neutral there right now. 
Amen. Brother Mike said the Holy Spirit. Through his word. Sue? Through his word. The word of God. I mean the word of God. That is, that is God's love letter. That is God's instruction manual. I mean the Bible, which mine are over down the pew over there, is one of the main ways God reveals himself to men. And what would anybody have any idea what the other two would be? One of you are going to go, oh, like a tag. You're going to go, oh. Prayer. Huh? Good prayer. Yeah, and, and that's not wrong. That, but but here, here's the question. I'm talking about how does God reveal himself not to save people? How does he reveal himself to mankind? Nature. Huh? Nature. nature. Creation. Uh, the Bible says in Romans 1 that it's clearly understood. And, and that's why I believe you got a heathen somewhere in a third world country or Africa somewhere. It is a third world country. but you, you And they don't have a church. They don't have a preacher preaching to them. God can reveal himself to them through his creation. That's a good answer, Brother Greg. So we got his creation. We got his word. The third one's gone. I'm telling you, you're going to do this number. For people? No, no. I mean, I mean, revealing to mankind, unsaved and saved, how does he reveal himself? A conscience. Huh? A conscience. Conscience, that, that, that's a good answer. Uh, you probably won't get it, because I'm not sure I would have, be honest with you. I'd have got the other two, but this one I wouldn't have got through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, he reveals himself to mankind. So that's the three ways that God reveals himself to man. Now, the, the one brother Greg said was the word of God. And that's what we've been studying. And that's what we're talking about studying. And you know, what gets me sometimes is people have been saved a long time and uh, or for a while, and they don't mean to, but you watch them. Like at our men's meetings, they're, they're just, if, if, if you can come, you really need to come. Uh, but the Lee Ridings is just doing to me I mean, a phenomenal job, isn't he, Brother Morris? I mean, just, you're really, I'm telling you, you're really missing it. We're going to try to record it next month, Patrick. If we came in here, could we record it next week? We could? Okay. We used to do that years ago. But but Lee Riding, when he comes, he passes out like a, uh, a, a, a lesson sheet for you to fill in the blank. And while he teaches, he don't really preach, he, he teaches slash preaches, uh, but it's pretty intense, it's really good stuff. You fill in the blanks, okay? And one thing he said Thursday night, and he said more than one thing, but our, he's really been driving home, if you've been there, he's really been driving home how the plan of God is and how Lucifer fights the plan of God and how our the goal of us really, really is to glorify God. Well, here's what I do why it's been going on. I watch some men and they're sitting there taking notes and they're and, and if you're not taking notes, don't get mad at me. I ain't picking on you. But I think you should. Uh, the man prepared it. It's got blanks that you won't remember. But if you put your name and you put the words in there, then you can go back like I did yesterday. I looked at the lesson again last night at the house a while. And uh, Bible study is for everybody, what I'm saying. Uh, well, I've been saved 40, 50 years. Well, ring a ding a ding. You still need to study the Bible. Are you saying you've arrived? Are you saying you know everything in the 66 books? Number one, if you are, you're a liar. That's what 1 John makes it clear of. Uh, number two, you're way too proud of yourself. 
Amen? And, uh, so there's, I mean, Brother Lee, Brother Lee, Thursday night, I mean, his great lesson, but right at the very end of it, Brother Greg, he just read Job 26. I mean, I, you know, I've read the Bible through 50 times, and I've preached, not on every verse of the Bible, but I've preached on a really good portion. And I've been preaching, I was sitting there thinking the other night, Brother Morris, I started preaching in 1972, and I only preached a few times in, in the 70s, only a handful of times. But I became pastor in 1978. When you're a pastor, you preach about 150 times a year. That's about what you preach. Not counting preaching off or preaching somewhere else. Well, do 150 times 40 years. Uh, 6,000 sermons. That, that, yeah. So I've preached a bunch of sermons. But I just have never seen those verses, Brother Morris. When he read them, like, remember them six questions? I just sat there and went, wow. Matter of fact, I prophesy, I told him, that you'll probably hear a sermon on it one day. I'll give him credit for the verses, but I'll put the meat on it. But you can never get enough of the Word of God. You never study it to a place that, you know, I mean, I've mastered it. You know, in our day, the big word is, He's an expert. Of course, I don't know how y'all are on that, but some of these called experts, I, I think all they are is perverts. Uh, some of them perverts, some of them perverts or whatever. Uh, but nobody ever, ever conquers the Bible. Nobody ever masters, I don't think, even part of the Bible. Because, I mean, how many of you have done this before? You've read a passage one time and seen this, then run a passage another time and see something else. Anybody ever done that? I mean, you just read it and you go, wow, I don't miss that. Night. I mean, like Job 26. I mean, I've read, I just read Job. I just read the whole book of Job probably two months ago. And and I, I wrote a few notes, but I just, I reckon I dozed through Job 26. But Bible study is work. And Bible study, we, we told you last week the nine things that Bible study does for you. And so that's the three ways that God reveals himself to man. Let's just review quickly through creation, through Jesus Christ, and through the Word of God. Now I've already told you, and I gave you a set of notes a few weeks ago, that the Bible is 66 books. And it's organized a certain way, of course, because there's nothing haphazard about God. Uh, a simple breakdown of the Old Testament is Genesis is considered a book of history. Uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are the books of the law. What, what do you mean, preacher? That's the books when God gave down the commandments and the law and the laws of Judaism in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then you have the history books. When you start in the book of Joshua, all the way through Esther, uh, yeah, all the way through Esther, you've got the history books. What are they the history of? They're the history of Israel. If you look at it, it's the beginning of Israel. It's uh, what they do, it's the nation Israel, who they fight, who their alliances are. Uh, David, Saul, uh, Absalom, all of them are in the... So these are books of history. Then you have what they call poetic books. Uh, and that is Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Psalms, Psalms. And by, by poetic books, it means they're written kind of in poetry form. That's, that's what it means, okay? And then next you have what's called the minor prophets, uh, which consists of uh, I mean, the major prophets, I mean, which consists of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And the only reason they're called major prophets, it's not that they're any more important, they're just larger. And when you have to break down the Bible, you're trying to get you some things to break it up. Then the next 12 books 
are called the minor prophets. And again, not because they're minor, not because they're less important, but because they're just smaller, and that's a good way to break them up. In the New Testament, you have 27 books. You have the four Gospels, which is basically the Chronicles, the Life of Christ, uh, and the Disciples, and really the beginning of Christianity uh, is when that started. Then the book of Acts is a history book. Uh, somebody tell me what the book of Acts is the history of. What do you think the book of Acts is a history of? Anybody know? Think about the book of Acts. Think about it. It's pretty. <clears throat> Some of your Bibles say this, like I used to have a Bible, and it said the Acts of the Apostles. You have a Bible said that? The Acts of the Apostles. Uh, and basically what it is is the Acts of the Apostles and I believe it's the Acts of the Church and the, found, and the real growth and outgrowth of the Church. Then you have what is called the Pauline Epistles and simply they're called that because who wrote them? Who wrote all the Pauline Epistles? The Apostle Paul did. So I start answering things I'm going to start getting quite mad. Then the rest of them are called general epistles, and that's, epistle is a letter, remember, it's just a, uh, one guy didn't know any better, and he said, there was a question, and this really happened in Bible college, there was a question on what is an epistle. He said it was the life of an apostle. Well, sounded good, pretty good guess, but that's not what an epistle is. Epistle is a letter. We would say, like if we're reading we would, if we were saying it today, we would say the letter of James. We'd say the letter to the Galatians. They said the epistle or whatever. And then you've got the book of prophecy, the book of Revelation. I'm kind of going real fast here. I want to get into right here a little bit. There are different ways to study the Bible. Um, I mean, I've told you the tools that you need. Uh, but there are different ways to study the Bible, like there are different ways to read the Bible. Some people read the Bible from Genesis 1-1, they read it chronologically, and they read it all the way to Revelation 22. Some people don't do it that way. They jump around, they move around, they kind of uh, are written randomly, pick books of the Bible and read them and and that's fine. Uh, I'll bring it next week. There, there's a system of reading the New Testament that I run across about 20 years ago. And it's not chronological. It actually has you read like the Gospels twice, the book of Acts three times, uh, the Pauline epistles like one time, First uh, John three times. Uh, and I did it. I did it a couple of times. And it really was a good way to read it. But there's lots of ways to read the Bible. We're going to talk about ways to study the Bible. Uh, there are basically, I'm going to say there are three methods of studying the Bible. Uh, there are probably more than that. But these are the three that I have kind of through the years. I mean, the Lord... You know, church, I told you this. The Lord was so good to me. I, uh, right where I lived at in Jacksonville, Florida, a, a, I mean, a wonderful, wonderful Bible college. I graduated in 1973. I did go up to Columbia Bible College a semester. My pastor told me, he said, you're not going to like it out there. You're not going to stay there. But Trinity Baptist College wasn't there in 70. Well, I went up to Columbia, South Carolina to the Columbia Bible College, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not being mean, but I mean, second chapel, we had a woman preacher. Uh, in my dorm room, uh, we had three of us in the room, and the guy on the right was a CCR and three-dog night freak. The guy on the left was Hank Williams. 
and it was allowed, and it was different. It was Methodist based. It wasn't a Baptist school, and so I lasted six weeks. I called my dad one day and I said, Daddy, I'm coming home. I went to church that Sunday. A pastor walked by me and said, I told you, you last long and I thought you would. But he said, I got some wonderful news for you. I said, what's that? He said, we're starting the college next September. So I was able to go to Trinity Baptist College. And really, I was able to go to it in its greatest days. Conservative, King James, straight as an arrow, Dr. Uh, had some teachers that were hard. It wasn't easy. It wasn't, uh, and, you know, I mean, I know some colleges now. Uh, my kids went to a couple of them, and the academics that they would had wouldn't have touched the academics I was given. But I said all of that because it really gave me such a good foundation. The Lord just, it was wonderful that he said, you know, I want you here four years. And I learned a really, really fantastic. I mean, we spent a whole year, okay. We spent a whole year, one class, on the book of Hebrews. We spent a whole year on New Testament survey. Uh, we spent a whole year on homiletics, the art of preaching and hermeneutics. And so, so I, you know, not that I'm smart or nothing, but, but the Lord blessed me there. So I'm going back to those days, kind of, and then what I've done through 40 years, I feel like there are three primary ways to study the Bible. Um, I like your involvement, but I'd like to know you're thinking and paying attention. Uh, anybody want to guess what the three are? Anybody want to give it a guess? If you think about it, it's pretty simple. Anybody want to give it a shot? What now? That, that's, that, that's pretty good. And, that, and I, I'm, not, I'm not taking that approach. With me. Yeah, topical. To, he said topical. Now, topical means that you study a topic or a subject. Otherwise, I want to study the topic or subject of grace. Okay? So I, the whole study goes into grace. And I, I do word studies. Uh, I get my luminous guide to the Bible and see what it says. Uh, I look up, when I, when I look up passages that deal with grace. I mean, the best way to start a topical study is with a concordance. You start with a concordance. Like this morning, I'm preaching on joy. And what I did last night at the house is I, on my phone, I, that's what I'll tell you, I do my Bible study on my phone now most of the time. I don't even need books with me. I, I've got this thing called Bible Tools. And last night I took the concordance and I looked up the word joy. See how many times, and it was, it, I, I can show you this, I did it last night. Look at that. How, many, how many times do you think joy is in the Bible? Just give it a shot. If I said 50, 100, or 200, what would you guess? How many times? 200. 175. Okay? Now, so I looked up literally. I really just took my concordance and I looked up every one. Because what I have on my phone, it don't just give you a regular book concordance, just gives you the verse and a sentence. But mine on my phone reads the whole verse to me. So I can look at the whole verse and see it. So a topical study means I'm studying a, you could call it, Charles Schaefer didn't call it topical, he called it subject study. That means you're studying a subject, a Bible subject, okay? Uh, grace, salvation, uh, prophecy, you know, and whatever you want to choose, you, you, you know. And that is a wonderful way to study the Bible. It is probably... I would say it's probably the most common way to study the Bible. Because you get a subject on your mind, and see, like I heard Brother David Gibbs preach on, you know, do, do not worry, and he preached about rejoicing and rejoying, and so that's been on my mind all week. So I sat there yesterday, and I said, well, let's look the word joy up. And, 
It, it's a wonderful way. And then if you have a Bible that is like a, if it's a chain reference Bible, a, a chain reference Bible like Thompson, which I think is the best personally to study with, I don't know to preach with it, but the reason I like Thompson is when you're reading every verse in the Bible, as you're reading that verse, beside it is some numbers. The numbers will say like 3369. Now all you do is you turn in the back of the Thompson Chain Reference Bible, and Ryrie, Ryrie has it, some other reference Bibles do. A reference Bible, a reference Bible means you're going to be given other verses that make, you know, coordinate with that verse. That's what the word reference means. Okay? So, in the Thompson Chain Reference Bible, I'll be reading something, and right beside that verse, it'll say the word, the subject, grace, I'm using that one a lot, grace, 3369, I know that one, that's what grace is. And you go in the back of the Thompson, and then it lists like 8, 10, 12, 14 verses to where that subject is true. So, so topical study or subject study is a really good way to study the Bible. A really, really good way. Um, probably again, if I study the Bible, I probably study it topically. Now I'm a preacher, I'm different than you, so I study it somewhat more systematically and expository, which is verse by verse. But I do a bunch of topical study. The sermon this morning came from a topical study that I did last night and a little bit Friday at Eddie's store. That's, that's where it comes from. Okay? So we've got the subject or the topical study. Okay? And again, all you need for that really is a good concordance and a dictionary, really, where you can look the words up and all, but a good concordance. Now, if you've got a smartphone, I'm just telling you, I mean, it's like a friend of mine told me five years ago, he said, you're still using books, Ed? I said, well, yeah. He said, Ed, you can take your phone and you've got concordances and dictionaries and commentaries right there. You can just sit there with a computer or your phone and not even have a book. So you've got a smartphone. There's a Bible study tool, websites and all that you can go to and help you study. Or a laptop or whatever you have. That, you know, if you want to do that, if you want to do it with the books and the pad and the pen, that's fine too. Either way is fantastic. Probably the pad and the pen is a little better because they told us in college what you hear you retain 30% of what you hear and write, you retain 60% of. That's why I like reading my Bible with, I mean, you know, seeing it and hearing it. But Alexander Scorby, I just get more out of it than just silently reading it. So there's topical uh, or subjects. And I have these notes for you. They're in the book. Now, I didn't get a chance. Miss Kelly wasn't in Thursday or Friday, so... I couldn't make the copies out of the book that I wanted to make for you. But that's one. Thank you, Eddie, for that. What was the other one you said, Eddie? Verse by verse. Verse by verse. And that's called expository. Okay? Uh, when a man preaches, for instance, uh, you can preach a topical sermon, which mean, of which I am today. Today's message, which I don't normally preach topical. I am more of an expository preacher. Uh, expository means verse by verse, chapter by chapter. That's it. Is. Otherwise, expository, uh, if, I, if I stood up today and said, okay, guys, I'm going to preach on Philippians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, okay? And I read 4, 5, and 6 to you. Then I started back in verse 4, and I hit it and hit it, 5 and 6. That is expository study. That is all. That can also be called chronological study, which means you're doing it in order. That's what that means. Uh, most of your great preachers in history, outside of the Bible, did expository preaching. Charles Spurgeon was almost totally expository. Uh, Whitfield was not. Whitfield was the exception. Whitfield did more topical and 
subject preaching. And, uh, you know, but uh, these are ways to study the Bible. You say, so how do I study an expository? I mean, how, well, you study it the same way I told you. Okay, let's say you want to study, today I want to study Ephesians chapter 2. Well, you take Ephesians 2, and here's how you do it. And I'll have these, I'll have these set of notes for you next week. I have them printed out for you. Uh, what you do is, you start in verse 1. And then what you do before you study, you read the entire passage you're going to study. If it's Ephesians 2, I said it's a popular one is Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10, where it's talking about being saved by grace through faith, that not of works. Uh, that's a great passage to study. Those 10 verse, verse 10 ends it up by saying, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works. So what you would do with this expository, what would you need until you pay attention now? What do you think you would need to study expository? And don't let the big word get you. Let's say verse by verse. Is that easier? We'll say verse by verse. Because that's what it is. So what would you think you would need to do a verse by verse study of the Bible? What tools would you need? <clears throat> Dictionary. Dictionary. Concordance. And the Bible. And the Bible. I'm glad you gave me a simple answer. Oh, I mean, are you listening to me? That's all you need. You don't need a Greek lexicon. You don't need 14 commentaries. See, you see, one, one of the devil's tricks he'll play with you, and Brother Lee Writings dealt with this Thursday night, is he'll make you think that this is really complicated. I mean, preacher, how do you know all of that? And, oh, it's because you went to Bible college and I never went to Bible God, so what you get to thinking is, well, I just can't study the Word. Yes, you can. I'm telling you, you can. You need a concordance, a dictionary, and a Bible. You can do any of the three kinds with those simple tools. Now, do you want to add to Matthew in your commentary, which I do? It's in my Bible study tool thing. It, it, I always look and see what he has to say. You say, why Matthew Henry? I think he's the greatest commentary, most conservative sonnet ever been written out of the Bible. Okay? I read his biography. He was a phenomenal man. Matthew Henry, he read through the Bible 260 times, and he would never read the Bible, Brother Morris, unless he was on his knees. He said God's Word deserved more respect than that. So anyway, so we got so we got verse by verse, and we got call it expository. But well, I got five minutes to hit, hit the last one because I want to do some other stuff next Sunday. Finish up. Um, what's the third kind? We got topical subject. We got verse by verse expository. What now? Well, yeah, yeah, systematic could kind of be expository. I mean, it, it could be, it, you, it could be, you could call it one. It, systematic means to go, you know, verse by verse. And, and, and this is almost connected to expository. But you can study it by books of the Bible. You can start and say, you know, I've never really understood the book of Jude a lot. I think I'll study the book of Jude. Okay? And you just, all you study, you take as long as it takes. You go into that book and you, you read about it, you study it, you uh, question. What do you need to do that kind of stuff? I know you know it. Come on. What do you need to do a book study? I'll give you the Bible first. And then what else do you need? I mean, you're shy, you don't know, you don't want to answer. I mean, I mean what else do you need? Well, okay. You would, 
you had my Bible college teacher, you'd be in trouble and fail the class. Uh, here's the thing. You need a Bible. You need a dictionary. You always need a dictionary when you're studying the Bible. Because dictionaries will allow you to do word studies. And when you can do word studies, you will understand the Word of God now. So you will always need a Bible for any of them. You'll always need a dictionary. Now, you'll always need a concordance. I mean, do you know what a concordance is? It's just a simple big reference book. You look up, you look up a subject, you put the word grace in, and it gives you in systematic order from Genesis to Revelation where that word grace is, how it's used. You need that. Now, I think you do need something else. I would say you wouldn't need anything else really for the first two kinds. I think you do need one thing else for studying my books. And that's the Matthew Henry Comment. I like a broken record, don't I think you do need a good commentary. If you don't get Matthew Henry, if you're studying the book of Jude, get a book by Ian Thomas on Jude. I think to study a book, it would do well to have a commentary because it will break down, it will break down information about the book, when it was written, who it was written to, why it was written, and when he says something, it'll make more sense to you, okay? Uh, when you're reading the book of Leviticus, you're reading the book for Israel. It's Israel's laws you're reading in Leviticus. They are not for us. We can learn from them practically, and we need to read them and believe them, but they are literally not for us. We don't live under the, Judea, the laws of Judaism. We live in the church age under grace. Okay? A commentary will tell you that. It'll tell you who wrote it, why he wrote it, who he wrote it to. Then when you read it, it makes more sense to you. Amen? You remember what I said I wanted to do as a class last week? We wanted to take up a little extra money each time and we give it, we're going to support a missionary with it. And uh, I'd like to do that. Can somebody get us just, uh, Brother Greg or anybody, Brother Moore, whoever, get us like an altar plate or something? And if you will, uh, uh, bring it around and we'll, we'll put, uh, if you bring, I mean, if we, if we take up $25 a week, that means we could support a missionary for $100 a month. That would be wonderful. How many of y'all agree that'd be wonderful? Amen? So I'm going to try to bring 5 or $10 every week, and it wouldn't take a lot for us to get $25 here you go, Brother Mike. I'll put uh, got some there. And if, you, if you didn't remember, didn't bring it, you can bring it next Sunday, double up, and bring me a Longhorn State, a state card or whatever if you want to. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. And, uh, and what we'll do, Brother Mike, with that, uh, when you get that, put it in an envelope and put on their adult Bible class for missionary, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain to Miss Cindy what we're doing. Okay? <laughs> Hey, Brother Shannon. Hey, Preacher. Hey, I, try, I didn't, uh, Chris and Vicky weren't here. Almost. Can you do, Brother Shannon, can you do, uh, Chris and uh, Jesse and Kelly can't be here. They're sick today. Can you do a song like we did, uh, from, like we did a couple of weeks ago? From who? From where? Huh? What song? But from YouTube or whatever.